So my name is Rob Blake. Um, I've been building web pages for a living for about 20 years now. And I'd like to argue that um, the web industry is probably, probably more than any other is responsible for introducing the concept of open source to the world at large. Now, uh, many years ago, I used to be famous for boring people about why they should be using open source. But the fact that we're here today celebrating open source for business would suggest that um, that message uh, has actually hit home. And um, we are in what I would like to describe now as the golden age of the, of the open web, given all of the amazing tools that have come to fruition and that have matured. But before we get into that, I'd just like to look back over the last 20 years, just to remind everybody uh, where we've been and what a long road it's been, really. So, who can remember this? In the beginning, the Mosaic browser with the grey backgrounds. I can remember exactly where I was when I saw that for the first time, that, that logo, and uh, it really has been a wild ride. Things have changed and evolved and developed more than anybody could have imagined uh, all those years ago. So when I, when I look back and think about the web, obviously Mosaic was my first uh, experience of it. But the thing that really made the web develop into the platform it is today, the first step, I feel, was the Netscape browser, which obviously introduced a load of stuff that you couldn't do in Mosaic. So you could do things like have a colored background, have an image background, etc. Now, of, of course, when the marketing people saw these web pages uh, with uh, colored backgrounds and this kind of stuff, their eyes popped out and they saw an opportunity to make money. Now, this often meant that we would have to start building things like forms for the marketing people to collect user details, which meant we had to process the data from the forms, which introduced a lot of people to good old Perl and the CGI scripting. And I think it's true to say that for many of us, for many of us web generalists, Perl was our first taste of web programming in earnest. And um, for me, it really was the first step into a world that I never really imagined that I would be getting involved with. Because of course, when you've got Perl, you start to learn about things like file permissions and other Unix type things. And it's not long before you're faced with learning about our friend Linux. Now, I think it's fair to argue that the web really helped the adoption of, of uh, Linux as an operating system, firstly on the, uh, on the server, of course, and uh, right down to the present day where we're starting to see the adoption of things like Ubuntu on the desktop. Now, of course, the thing, one of the main components of the LAMP stack, along with Linux itself, is the Apache web server, MySQL, the database of choice for many, many years and for many, many web developers. PHP came along and replaced Perl. Now, you might think that given all of these wonderful open source tools, the people, the web agencies who are building web pages would have started to develop some uh, lovely open source products of their own, but unfortunately, it wasn't to be. So back in the day, back in the 1990s, when I was building websites for large companies like Levi Strauss and Interbrew, uh, we were charging them a lot of money and uh, we were actually locking them in with our uh, proprietary content management systems that we built with lovely open source software. And uh, I'm, unfortunately, this is, uh, this is something that went on for at least a decade where large clients investing lots of money in systems that were not documented, they were not peer reviewed, there's no quality control. And most of all, it meant that they couldn't take their business elsewhere. They were effectively locked into using the same agency and if they decided they'd like to leave uh, that agency, it would often mean throwing away the investment, throwing away the website, throwing away the content management system, and starting again. <coughs> and of course, the agencies absolutely loved lock-in because it just meant that they could make loads of money. <sighs> now, it doesn't get any better. Unfortunately, Microsoft jumped in with the lovely uh, Internet Explorer. And if that wasn't bad enough, we got Macromedia Flash. Now, I don't know how many web developers we've got out there, but I know you hate it as much as I do. 
thankfully, uh, we're coming to the end of the flash era now, and I think that's probably the only thing we can be uh, grateful to Apple Computer for. So, around 1998, everything went mad with the uh, dot-com boom. I was right in the middle of it in Shoreditch, building websites for uh, all kinds of stupid ideas that were never going to work. But, you know, nobody really cared as long as they had six-figure sums to throw at their, uh, their websites. So, yeah. So, a lot of people, a lot of web agencies in London made frightening amounts of money in that era. And everybody had a great time. Uh, yes. I don't actually remember a lot of that, of that era, but, you know, I definitely was there. Um, sadly, though, it wasn't to last. Of course, the first major tech bubble, the dot-com bubble, burst. And uh, a lot of people lost their shirts. A lot of people lost a lot of money on silly ideas that were never going to work, but they seemed like a good idea at the time. And then we get to what I like to call the Middle Ages. It's a very sad time for me because this is when uh, Internet Explorer version 6 was released uh, in around 2001. So this is kind of after the, after the bubble burst, after the crash. Uh, people are realizing that the web is not going to go away and uh, it is a force to be reckoned with. People like Microsoft throw everything at getting as much uh, market share for their browser as they possibly can. And of course, uh, good old Macromedia Flash is along there too. Uh, remember this? Before, before uh, PHP and MySQL and all of the others uh, took over, it looked for a long time that .NET was going to uh, dominate the server. Thankfully, it wasn't to be. And actually, I think I'm right in saying that Microsoft have since open sourced .NET as a platform. In the background, though, uh, kind of as a reaction to the sort of uh, lock-in that we were talking about uh, earlier, while everything seemed rather depressing with uh, Flash and IE6 and all these other things, quietly we're starting to get these newfangled open source content management systems slowly beginning to appear, slowly proliferating. I just chose uh, a few for illustrative purposes. There's actually about 50 that I could have put, put on there. Uh, there's a few names that we're going to come back to in, in a while. So just to kind of think about how far we've come, 2004 was the year that WordPress was uh, uh, born, invented by Mike Little and Matt Mullenweg. Um, I checked out the, uh, the browser stats for the month that uh, WordPress arrived, and uh, Microsoft Internet Explorer had more than 90% of the browser market at that point. So effectively, Microsoft were going for an embrace and extend strategy. They didn't really care about open source or open standards. They knew that because they were shipping the browser with Windows XP, that it was a de facto standard. And uh, personally, I'm quite relieved that their strategy didn't work because I think we'll be looking at a very different web today. So now, 2010, is what I like to think of as the beginning of the golden age. And of course, whenever we're talking about open source, we're also talking about open standards. And that these two concepts are so closely wedded, particularly in this web context, I don't think we can uh, separate them at all. So around 2010, uh, there's a lot of discussion, a lot of development of HTML5 as a standard. Uh, the beginnings of this idea that maybe, you know, we could start to think about moving away from proprietary standards like Flash. Of course, WordPress came to dominate all of the other open source systems and most of the other proprietary systems. I think today it's in use on around 26% of the top 100 million websites by traffic volume. Uh, I love it. Um, it's, a, it's a lovely piece of software. It has its faults, but... It's open source, and it's currently powering the open web. Flash is going down, thanks to Apple and Steve Jobs and everything they've done with uh, iOS and the iPhone and the iPad to not support it. And as I said before, I think that's one thing that we can be very grateful to Cupertino for. And of course, the open source browsers fight back. Now, uh, Firefox got its beginnings in the Netscape code base. Um, 
I was going to use the Google Chrome uh, icon for this slide, but obviously it's uh, debatable whether or not Google Chrome is actually open source, although it does exist in a properly open source variant, Chromium. But I think, you know, with the web, given that, you know, you've got the browsers and you've got the servers, you know, it's, it's fascinating how all over open source is dominating now. Open source is the standard. Uh, something else that's uh, really contributed to this idea of a golden age is the birth of Git and the birth of social coding. And I think it's very difficult to uh, exist in the web industry today if you're not fully engaged with um, GitHub and the various other social coding uh, places that you can find online. And just the sheer variety and quality of code that's to be found on there and that can be used for client work is absolutely staggering. Node.js, uh, if you're building WordPress themes, if, you, if you're using WordPress these days, you're, you're almost certainly be using uh, Node.js build tools for uh, uh, working with your CSS, etc. And uh, a lot of people now are just building websites using uh, only JavaScript tools. Uh, personally, I love this Roots Bedrock Trellis Trio, uh, used by the American government for their data.gov uh, site. It's, uh, the idea of this project is to bring the very best open source tools from outside of the WordPress universe, bring them into the WordPress uh, universe and make them easy to use. Um, it makes for really, really high quality uh, work. Of course, Ubuntu, which I'm running on my laptop, is actually quietly dominating the cloud. If you look at a lot of these uh, VPS systems, if you look at a lot of OpenStack uh, installs, uh, Ubuntu is now the, the standard. It's, you know, the numbers are absolutely mind-boggling. Mobile browsing takes off. Again, uh, it's open source. I mean, Android may not quite be Linux, but really it's more standards and open source based than, than iOS, and it is dominating. And just to kind of uh, ram the point home, we can see that from the 94% that we looked at in 2004, we're down to 13% for Internet Explorer. And this is the current uh, usage stats for this month. But then every silver lining has a cloud. And of course, where we have uh, open source, we also have uh, commoditization. Now, I'm not complaining. I mean, I'm actually really happy that open source has, has won this uh, web battle. Uh, but for a lot of people in the business of designing and building websites, it is uh, presenting a lot of challenges. Um, not just because of the commoditized nature of the tools, but because of the ubiquitous nature of the tools. The barriers to entry into this industry are getting lower and lower all the time. And there's more and more and more uh, young kids um, studying in MOOCs, in places like Udemy, to become full-stack web developers and web designers. And I'm all for it. I just think we have to be mindful about uh, what that means for us as an industry. So one of the things that uh, contributes to this idea that websites should either be uh, free or very, very cheap uh, is the availability of millions of quality WordPress themes. So. Why would somebody want to, why would a small business want to come along and spend five, ten, fifteen thousand pounds on a custom design WordPress site when, uh, you know, they can just go to Theme Forest and spend uh, anywhere between ten dollars and a hundred dollars for what are very uh, professionally designed and very nicely put together themes. So that definitely does put pressure on prices if your business is designing and building custom websites. And then, of course, uh, we're now in the era of the social network. And there's actually quite a complex relationship between this idea of open source and open standards and the likes of Facebook and Twitter and LinkedIn because actually a lot of these social networks have actually been quite good for open source and have actually funded a lot of development which has gone back into the community. Facebook in particular um, are very good around PHP. They developed the hip hop virtual machine, which uh, has seen WordPress serve pages faster than ever before. I think all of the major social networks you know, have an involvement in the, the development of open source. 
but then all of them have a huge effect um, on what people can charge to design and build uh, websites and web pages. Um, previously, I've done a lot of work for the UKTI. Um, I for many years, we specialised in doing uh, internationalised uh, responsive websites for small to medium sized businesses and we did very well. Unfortunately this year they've uh, changed their guidance to, the, to their clients and they're actually saying to them now, well you don't really need a website, why not just have a LinkedIn page, why not just have a Facebook page. Um, so that's quite difficult for us given that they were handing out up to 50% of the cost as in a grant for companies that wanted to improve their website and maybe internationalise their website, now they're saying save you money and um, just go to LinkedIn, just go to Facebook. So that obviously does make it difficult for us. Uh, on the horizon we've got uh, these new services. This is a logo from a service called The Grid. I'm actually yet to be convinced that this is going to be everything that it's cracked up to be, but what they're saying is that they can use AI to uh, design and build uh, custom websites. Um, a lot of the marketing stuff that they've got uh, seems to be slightly vapid to me, but then other people that I know are convinced that this is going to be a thing and that this is going to be very popular, so no doubt this will also have an effect um, on the web business. Of course, apps. Um, the thing about uh, Apple is that their iPhone and uh, iPads are among the most popular uh, devices, as we know. And um, we are seeing a bit of a shift now of uh, investment away from the open web and more into, um, into mobile apps. Now, I would argue that maybe we should be looking at doing something that's uh, multi-platform, cross-platform, a single code base uh, that you can then deploy to a website or you can deploy to an app, something like Meteor JS, possibly. So given, uh, given this really is, uh, for us in the web industry, um, the best of times, but also the worst of times, um, what, can we do? You know, what can we do to stay in business, keep our customers happy? So I think one of the main things is obviously uh, specialization. Um, I think in any given vertical market, if you know more about your clients and their business, if you know more about that than the next guy, if rather than being a, uh, a sort of do-it-all web agency, if you specialise in a certain industry vertical, you've got a huge advantage. As I said before, I think we can see that there's a bit of a shift towards the, uh, the mobile apps rather than just um, websites on the open web. And there is an amazing tool called Meteor.js, which does allow you to develop in one place and then deploy to app stores, but then also deploy to a website. And I think that approach is probably going to be more and more popular. Uh, we find that uh, internationalization is something that adds a lot of complexity to web design and development. It's not something that a lot of uh, web designers and web developers like to get involved in because of the complexity. So we find that that's something that hasn't quite uh, been commoditized in the same way. Uh, my business partner John is actually registered blind and we've, we've capitalized on that by doing a lot of uh, accessibility work, which again is something uh, which just makes you a little bit different. It's something that is quite complex and it's something that again hasn't really been commoditized and it does help to get the budgets that you're looking for. And then we don't really like to admit it, but this whole web design, web development thing usually is marketing. I've tried to avoid marketing my, for the last 20 years, but really, that's what we're doing. And increasingly, we're having to get more and more sophisticated in that regard. So, as well as just designing uh, and building websites for your clients, there's a lot of other things around that which you can do to add value. Um, and we find that, you know, one of the things that we've learned over the years is that websites are not like uh, brochures or leaflets or posters. It's not something that you can just design, build, you know, throw out and then move on to the next one. They're much more organic. They're like living things that need to be cared for and, and uh, they need to be fed. And often the client is too busy and too uh, focused on their business to actually do that kind of stuff. So increasingly we're offering 
support and maintenance, we're offering copywriting services, we're, we're getting into curation, so that's really about looking at stuff for our clients, often within their uh, market, within their industry, and just posting them on blogs for them, you know, helping them to just keep abreast of what's going on in their own industry uh, and add value like that. Um, obviously, the whole thing about uh, UX and UI is that it needs to be uh, measured, and I think this is where analytics is really, really important. I think um, the idea that you can design a website and it's perfect first time it has been proved to be uh, completely wrong. Uh, a website needs to be continuously improved and uh, you know, looking at the data, looking at the analytics to have a look at how it performs is absolutely key to doing that. And then these things are kind of more obvious, but the consultancy side of this, having been doing this for 20 years, you know, me and my colleagues do feel that we have a lot of value to offer in terms of our experience in, in how things work and, and what, what should be done. And increasingly, this idea of uh, community building uh, is a popular one because, again, what this is really about is about the users, the end users. Too much web design and web development in the past has been about trying to impress the marketing director of the client, but increasingly it's about engaging with your client's customers. And if we can, if we can uh, do that by building a community, um, all the better, and that's definitely something that we're going to be uh, focusing our, ourselves on. So uh, that's it. Has anybody got any questions? Well, thank you very much, Rob. Yeah.